recently established the Financial Stability Oversight Council's Working Group on Digital Assets. This FSOC group enables U.S. financial regulators such as FinCEN, the Fed, OCC, CFTC, CFPB, SEC, and other key stakeholders to work together to combat risks posed by cryptocurrencies. As the President has said, Bitcoin is highly volatile and based on thin air. We are concerned about the speculative nature of Bitcoin and will make sure that the U.S. financial system is protected from fraud. Welcome to the video everyone, you are here with Bo Stoner from Cryptocurrency Australia, the channel where Bitcoin, economics and politics come together. Now in the past five hours we've had the Secretary of the Treasury, Steve Mnuchin, hold a press conference where he has identified a new working group that is coming together to work on cryptocurrencies as they see cryptocurrencies as posing a potential national security threat. It's a, a very big statement, as you would have heard in that video earlier, how Steve Mnuchin actually referenced uh, Donald Trump's tweets. And this is a big deal, no matter how you look at it, this is a big deal for cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin moving forward, uh, specifically in the United States, but potentially also on a global scale. So we're going to read through this article, and then we're going to go into some other uh, news that has been happening in the past month in relation to kind of what I see as a preliminary <clears throat> global regulatory framework that is being slowly seeded into the public consciousness. So to begin with, let's read through this article. Cryptocurrencies pose a national security threat, Mnuchin says. Washington. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin on Monday said he has very serious concerns about cryptocurrencies, including the one being developed by Facebook, the latest indication that Washington is preparing to exert its power over digital currencies. In a briefing at the White House, Mr. Mnuchin said cryptocurrencies pose a national security threat, since they can be used to fund illicit activities. He also said that the Trump administration is not comfortable with Facebook's plans to begin a new digital payment system called Libra. Now, just quickly jumping in, guys, we obviously know that the US dollar is used to fund uh, illicit programs as well. Uh, you know, that's a given. And I don't think I don't think his comments are designed in such a way to negate that particular reality. It's just specifically talking about cryptocurrencies um, in this particular context. Right. But we've also talked about Facebook's Libra a lot, and I've been quite vocal on this channel and on my personal Twitter that Facebook's Libra is not going ahead. I called that about six weeks ago, so nothing new there. Moving on. The warnings come after similar comments by President Trump, who said in a series of tweets last week that he is not a fan of cryptocurrencies and that their value is volatile and based on thin air. Mr. Trump warned Facebook that it must seek a banking charter and follow all banking regulations if it wants to be in the digital currency business. Despite their growing popularity, the Trump administration has said little about cryptocurrencies in the last two years. Mr. Mnuchin has largely described the new technology for creating, moving and storing money as a potential consumer protection issue rather than a threat to the financial system. Regulators have long focused on how to minimize crime in the cryptocurrency industry, but it has tended to be a wonky issue that has not attracted much public attention. But Facebook's announcement of Libra has spurred Washington's interest in cryptocurrencies. Now, just jumping in there again, um, like I said, I've been very vocal on, on Libra not going ahead. But I also said, and I believe that Libra was allowed to go public in the sense that the project being announced for a reason. I, I feel like Washington knew it was coming and allowed it to happen to either play into a particular narrative or agenda for them to come back on. Now, if you look at this now in hindsight, where it said um, this comment here, but Facebook's announcement of Libra has spurred Washington's interest in cryptocurrencies, maybe there was things going on behind the scenes and they were merely waiting for an event such as a 
a not a Facebook's not a private company; it's a public company. But a, a, a company like Facebook, a global company like like Facebook, to announce that they had plans for cryptocurrencies and then to use that as leverage to enact some additional regulatory controls that were happening in the background, but they needed an event to trigger that, if that makes sense. And what better event uh, to use than a global company like Facebook that is having issues around privacy, that is facing potential litigation? Uh, What better to use a company like that to leverage into a particular agenda from the administration? Reading on. The chair of the Federal Reserve, Jerome H. Powell, said last week that the central bank has serious concerns about Libra and has been in contact with Facebook regarding its project. This week, the House and Senate will hold hearings about Libra and lawmakers plan to grill David Marcus, the Facebook executive who is overseeing the project. Facebook was asked to cease work on the project until it addresses lawmakers' concerns. Facebook's crypto foray has renewed attention to the thousands of cryptocurrencies that flourished after the original digital currency, Bitcoin, which was released in 2009 and envisaged a new kind of money that would not be controlled by any government or central authority. Bitcoin was presented by its mysterious creator, Satoshi Nakamoto, as a largely political project aimed at challenging central banks and government. Now that is true as we know that in the Genesis block, the Coinbase, the message in there, referenced uh, the bailout of banks in 2009. So we, we do know that there were political economic underpinnings to Bitcoin's release as a, an alternative decentralized currency to avoid another GFC. Reading on. But from the early days, Bitcoin gained traction among people looking to do illegal transactions online. The Silk Road, an online market for illegal drugs, came online in 2011 and became a booming business with every payment sent in Bitcoin. In recent years, there have been many legitimate businesses set up around cryptocurrencies. Most of these businesses are focused on using Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as investment products, similar to gold. Several large financial institutions, including Goldman Sachs and Fidelity, have begun to offer products related to Bitcoin to their customers. This mainstream validation has helped give Bitcoin a sheen of legitimacy and pushed up the price of the digital token. But it it has also led to increased volatility in the price of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. The price of a single Bitcoin soared to nearly $20,000 in early 2018. Since then, it crashed down to $3,000, but has risen swiftly again in the recent months to around $12,000. Bitcoin has also become the standard currency for ransomware operations in which victims lose control of their computer to remote hackers. Victims are only able to get their files back if they send a Bitcoin payment. Many cities have lost control of their computer networks to these kind of attacks. That that is referencing... um, I can't remember what, exactly what the virus was called, but back in that back, it was a couple of years ago, they were requesting Bitcoin. But I doubt you would see any new kind of attacks requesting Bitcoin because, as we know, Bitcoin is pseudonymous, it's not anonymous. And through blockchain analysis and machine learning, there are companies out there that could, can do incredible work on tracking down addresses uh, and their locations. And there's a bunch of different techniques they can use. So I would doubt any this is still happening. I would say if this is happening, They'd be requesting other current privacy-based currencies like Monero or potentially even Zcash. Reading on. On Monday, Mr. Mnuchin cited the use of Bitcoin in terrorist financing, tax evasion and human trafficking, though so far law enforcement officials have brought few cases in those areas. The Treasury Department has expressed very serious concerns that Libra could be misused by money launderers and terrorist financiers, he added. We will not tolerate the use of cryptocurrencies in support of illicit activities. Now, I want to jump in here because it's very powerful language. This is very powerful language coming from a very powerful person. Despite my own love for cryptocurrencies, despite my own um, involvement in cryptocurrencies and investment and all the things I've done, to be objective and to look at this rationally, this is very powerful language coming from a very powerful person. And I do think it is a cause for concern. I do think this is, as I will explore in later articles, a risk, an early warning sign risk as to what may be coming in the United States and how this may affect the rest of the world over time. Just wanted to add that because um, we have to understand, and I know this is going to make a lot of people angry, what's going on at the moment, and they completely um, were within their rights to feel that emotion. But taking emotion out of the equation and looking at this objectively, this is powerful language from a powerful person. And he has the support of 
the president of the United States, leader of the free world. We can't underestimate that. Reading on. Facebook does not intend to release the currency until next year, but the company has big ambitions for the project, which it hopes will become a new global currency and the foundation for an alternative global financial system. Well, we know that that's basically not going to happen. Those ambitions and Facebook's broader reputational problems have made the project such a lightning rod for controversy. We know we need to take the time to get this right, Mr. Marcus, the Facebook executive, said in testimony released ahead of the Senate Banking Committee hearing. And I want to be clear, Facebook will not offer the Libra digital currency until we have fully addressed regulatory concerns and received appropriate approvals. Facebook has designed Libra so that it will run it will be run by a Swiss association governed by at least 100 companies and other partners, rather than just Facebook itself. When Facebook announced Libra, it said it had already had 27 partners, including big players like Uber, Mastercard, Visa, and Spotify. But so far, those partners have largely remained silent, and Facebook has borne the brunt of the scrutiny facing Libra. It is clear that Facebook will be facing a raft of new regulations and public scrutiny as it proceeds. Mr. Mnuchin said that cryptocurrencies must comply with the Bank Secrecy Act and register with the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. They must also meet the same anti-money laundering and counterfeiting standards as traditional financial firms. The Secretary also expressed concerns about the speculative nature of Bitcoin and about Facebook's problems protecting the privacy of its users. Our overriding goal is to maintain the integrity of a financial system and protect it from abuse. Now just jumping in here, this is another really important part to note because... As President Donald Trump said, the US dollar will be and will continue to be the world's global currency. And we need to understand this from a broader perspective about the control the United States can exert on the world and the leverage it has in negotiations against the world by controlling its own currency. They're never going to let a currency like Bitcoin naturally, or they're going to at least resist it naturally growing to enough dominance where the United States starts losing leverage. You know, from like a political maneuvering perspective, of of course, they're always going to back their own currency. But it's also important to note, again, coming back to the language being used by Steve Mnuchin here in relation to the speculative nature of Bitcoin. As you saw in that video, he referenced in particular President Donald Trump's uh, comment around Bitcoin being valued out of thin air, which I don't agree with. I, I've written blogs about it. I've talked about it on numerous occasions. I think Bitcoin has tremendous intrinsic value in it, both in its utility and in the way the network operates. But what I think <laughs> pales in comparison to the Secretary of the, of the United States Treasury and the President. Reading on. The Trump administration's concerns about Libra appear to be bound up in the President's broader distrust of the social networking giant. Mr. Trump sent out his tweets about Libra soon after coming from a social media summit in which he criticized Facebook and other big tech companies, accusing them of silencing conservative voices, including his. Mr. Mnuchin insisted that the administration was not trying to retaliate against Facebook. No, we're not trying to target any one entity, he said. Everybody is playing by the same rules. Mr. Powell, the Fed chair, expressed similar concerns about Libra last week, telling lawmakers it could not go forward without there being broad satisfaction with the way the company has addressed money laundering all those things. He also raised data privacy and consumer protection concerns, saying all of those things will need to be addressed very thoroughly and carefully in a deliberate process that will not be a sprint to implementation. Skepticism about Libra and cryptocurrencies more broadly represent a rare issue where the Trump administration and some Democrats are united. Last week, Senator Sherrod Brown, Democrat of Ohio, called on the Fed to protect consumers from Facebook's monopoly money. The largest banks and the largest tech companies do not act in the interest of working Americans, but in the interest of themselves and their investors, Mr. Brown said. The Fed must take a proactive role to ensure that the payment system remains accountable to the public. However, Republicans have tended to be more sympathetic to the cryptocurrency industry and have positioned it as something that the government should be working to protect as a check against government and corporate power. Just this week, Representative Kevin McCarthy, the House Minority Leader, argued in a New York Times op-ed that cryptocurrencies and the networks they create could provide an answer to the privacy scandals facing the internet giants. The President's Acting Chief of Staff, Mick Mulvaney, has been a vocal advocate of Bitcoin in the past. So in summary, you know, before we move on, um, you know, these are very interesting developments. These are, these are very interesting developments that I don't think anyone would have predicted would have been so... 
um, kind of harsh against Bitcoin. I think we need to pay particular attention to the language. What is the message that Trump and Steve Mnuchin and the, you know, what is the agenda of bringing all of these financial organizations in the United States together to regulate Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies? What is their agenda? Is their agenda to make it difficult for people to gain access for these markets to thrive and innovate? Are they merely trying to stop any form of illegal use for these cryptocurrencies? Or are they trying to kill it? I think all those questions need to be asked and assessed rationally and objectively. Overall, what's my comments? I think the risk has gone up for Bitcoin and crypto. I think the United States has far more influence over the world's financial markets than what a lot of people give it credit for. I think through bodies like the FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, they are going to be able to exert the control in terms of regulations over the world, as we will soon see, as I'll show you. Overall, I think the risk has gone up, right? Just based on the strength of this language. Um, I just think that's a really important to note, but we're gonna look at some other things and we're gonna look at some other people's opinions on what they think of this at the moment, because some people are actually seeing this as a positive. And funnily enough, well, it's not funny, this is what Bitcoin does. It has reacted positively to this and is up 10%, you know? So who knows? But anyway, let's move on and look at some other information, guys. Just recapping on Donald Trump's tweet, because I think this is an important point to, to cover because of just how strong the language was before we move on. He says, I'm not a fan of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, which are not money and whose value is highly volatile and based on thin air. Unregulated crypto assets can facilitate unlawful behavior, including drug trade and other illegal activity. Similarly, Facebook's Libra's virtual currency will have little standing or dependability. If Facebook and other companies want to become a bank, they must seek a new banking charter and become subject to all banking regulations, just like other banks, both national and international. We have only one real currency in the United States, and it is stronger than ever, both dependable and reliable. It is by far the most dominant currency anywhere in the world, and it will always stay that way. It is called the United States dollar. Now, moving on to some supporting articles we have here. All This, this was from back in uh, June the 21st. All global crypto exchanges must now share customer data, FATF rules. So I'm not going to go into this, but I'm going to go into what this kind of means from a regulatory standpoint and how this is the way the United States is exerting its influence over the world in relation to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And that's being done through the FATF. So what is the FATF? The FATF is called the Financial Action Task Force. And it's a global task force where all these subsidiary um, countries sign up to. And it's how they kind of implement um, cross-border regulatory frameworks in relation to the financial system to mitigate or prevent money laundering and terrorist financing. So at the moment, the United States, I believe, is chairing the FATF, which means they kind of have more control or dominance over where the direction that the regulations go. Now, here's some of these subsidiary countries that sign up to the FATF. And as you can see, you know, it's just about every country in the world. So this organization that the United States is influencing the world through has tremendous power. I mean, look at all these countries that are signed up to it. Now, the point of this was um, essentially the Steve Mnuchin through the FATF proposed some new guidance around the usage and identification of wallet addresses. Now, this is a big one. Just reading a couple of caps here so we understand the context. The final recommendation makes official the contentious part of FATF's February proposal, saying countries should make sure that when crypto businesses send money, they obtain and hold required and accurate originator, sender information, and required beneficiary recipient information, and submit the information to beneficiary institutions, if any. Further, that countries should ensure that beneficiary institutions obtain and hold required, not necessarily accurate, originated information and required and accurate beneficiary information. So as we can see, guys, that's a pretty big deal because it's essentially changing the requirements, the basic fundamental requirements of how cryptocurrencies work at a protocol level by requiring additional information and essentially KYC on wallet and wallet addresses. That's the way I interpreted this. And that is a big deal because the industry is going to have to develop that infrastructure to comply with the FATF. 
Now, you might say, well, what if countries don't want to comply? Well, there's something called the FATF blacklist. The FATF blacklist was the common shorthand description of the Financial Action Task Force list of non-cooperative countries or territories. The FATF blacklist or OECD blacklist has been issued by the Financial Action Task Force since 2000 and lists countries which it judges to be non-cooperative in the global fight against money laundering and terrorist financing. So in a nutshell, if countries don't comply, they can be listed as a non-cooperative country or territory. Now, what does that actually mean? The centrality of blacklists in almost all uh, of those explanations also raises difficult questions that deserve some attention at this point. The internal logic is reasonable. The FATF names states or jurisdictions that are non-compliant, signaling to market actors that transactions with institutions in those jurisdictions may be subject to additional scrutiny by the blacklisting states. This potential added difficulty compels market actors to either divest currently held assets or avoid new transactions in targeted countries, which harms the targeted jurisdiction's economy. Targets, or would-be targets, comply with the FATF standards to avoid that fate. In my interviews with delegates to and from FATF, informants generally stress first that the FATF was about knowledge creation and persuasion, but follow that quickly with the idea that the threat of material enforcement was necessary too. A German Treasury official's comments were typical. When asked why states do not want to be blacklisted, he responded, fear. Why was there fear? Loss of reputation, debt ratings, a loss of image. Talking about the case of uh, Liechtenstein, Sharman writes, in many cases it is difficult to conclusively link material decline to the effects of blacklisting, but the general opinion among government officials and those in the financial services industry was that the lists caused the damage. As we can see, essentially these countries, which is just about every country in the world, is a member of the FATF. If the FATF issues new guidelines and countries don't comply, they can be blacklisted. If they're blacklisted, they can, find it, they can face economic damage, they can face reputational damage, uh, or they can have uh, uh, debt ratings, essentially debt ratings. So they can have, I can't remember what they're called, but they can have these ratings applied to these countries that make it less likely for a World Bank to lend them money. Because these World Banks are going to want to lend money to countries that are doing the right thing. Now, here we have kind of an alternative opinion from a cryptocurrency a lawyer who is, who is uh, experienced and vocal in the cryptocurrency space, uh, Jake Chavinsky. And he said this on June 23. The Financial Action Task Force just published new guidance on anti-money laundering regulations for virtual assets. From media reports alone, you might think it was an unprecedented assault on crypto. Of course, it wasn't. Here's what you should know. The FATF is a Paris-based international organization that develops policies and conducts evaluations related to regulations for anti-money laundering and combating the financing of terrorism. FATF has 36 member countries, including the largest financial centers in the world. Importantly, FATF doesn't have any regulatory authority of its own. FATF makes recommendations, not laws. Member countries can adopt all, some, or none of FATF's recommendations. There are basically no repercussions for adopting or for violating FATF recommendations. And I responded to Jake having done some research on this, and I said, Hi Jake, what about the FATF blacklisting countries who do not comply with recommendations? Surely, surely the blacklisting threat of non-cooperative country or territory will be enough to encourage member countries to comply and given the might of the US is behind it. And Jake responded, the blacklist certainly matters, as I explained in response to another question, see below, but it takes a lot more than simply failing to implement a few niche recommendations to get blacklisted. This isn't a serious concern for most countries. Um, so that's interesting. Jake had an interesting take on that, that essentially what he's saying is that just because countries don't implement, or if they don't implement, a few recommendations in relation to cryptocurrency, KYC requirements for wallets, then they might not get blacklisted. And he could be right. I, I really don't know. But it was interesting seeing his opinion on that, especially given that he has a, a law background. So be sure to go and follow Jake as well. He does have some um, some great insights into the law side. He's uh, at Jay uh, Chavinsky. So moving on. What you might have noticed that when Steve Mnuchin was giving that speech at that press conference, he mentioned uh, an organization called the CFTC. Now, the CFTC is uh, essentially responsible for things like futures contracts, options and derivatives in the United States. Now, the CFTC has just got a new chairman called Heath Talbot. And here we have an article here. Who is T uh, Heath Talbot? What does he think of crypto? Just reading the first couple of paragraphs here. July 15 will mark the 
the first day in the office of the United States Commodity Futures Trading Commission's new chairman, Heath Tarbert. As the crypto community is bidding farewell to the regulator's outgoing head, J. Christopher Giancarlo, his successor's stance on digital assets remains unknown. Turning to Tarbot's record as a civil servant and attorney in the financial markets field could shed some light on the direction that the agency might take under his leadership. Giancarlo, Giancarlo's five-year tenure saw the rise of cryptocurrency derivatives as an object of regulatory oversight. Widely regarded as the crypto industry's ally, Crypto Dad superintended the historic launch of regulated Bitcoin futures and advocated for a do-no-harm approach to blockchain, blockchain regulation in his testimony before the US Congress. At the same time, as some observers have pointed out, Giancarlo has stepped up enforcement efforts, turning the CFTC into an agency with teeth. The news of President Donald Trump's nominating Tarbert, a senior official in the Treasury Department, to serve as the new head of the CFTC emerged in December 2018. On June 5th, 2019, the Senate voted to confirm his appointment by a wide margin, 84 to 9. Although Giancarlo's tenure expired in April 2019, he agreed to stay until mid-July to oversee the agency's transition to new leadership. In a statement, the outgoing chairman offered praise to his heritor, calling him highly qualified to continue transforming the agency into a 21st century regulator for today's digital market. Now, just kind of digesting that a little bit, we have a, uh, an existing chairman going out and a new chairman coming in that was appointed by Donald Trump. What does Donald Trump think of crypto? Well, we know. What is this guy think, going to think of crypto? Well, we don't know. But would President Trump appoint someone to this position that didn't uh, toe the line? You know, in basic terms. You know, sometimes you heard the phrase, better the devil you know than the devil you don't. And I think that's in this case. This is another potential risk for Bitcoin and cryptos in the United States moving forward. Um, I like to look at like, you know, plan for the worst, hope for the best. And we just don't know. We don't know what this guy's going to think like. Like I said, given the fact that he's been appointed by President Donald Trump, we know what Donald Trump thinks about Bitcoin and crypto. You know, I think it's a risk. But now let's take a look at some other people's opinions, some people far more important than me, people that know a lot more than me, to get their take on what they see of this latest stance from Steve Mnuchin and to get their insights into what this may mean for cryptocurrencies moving forward. First up by Thomas Lee, none other. Article here from Yahoo, Donald Trump's Bitcoin roast is a positive thing, Thomas Lee. Donald Trump's recent attack on the crypto space could push Bitcoin up to $40,000 by year end, according to Fundstrat Global Advisors' head of research, Thomas Lee. In an interview with Yahoo Finance, he said, on balance is a positive because cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin really are in the main stage now, with the Congress, the Fed, the President weighing in. And he's very right. Lee added, it's going to force everybody who is not involved, and remember a very small percentage actually cares about crypto and Bitcoin. It's going to force the other 98% of the world to think about what it means. That's another very good point from Tom. Bitcoin is now trading at a rarely seen level, he noted. If you go back to every milestone that, that was achieved, Bitcoin subsequently rallied somewhere between 200 to 400% within the next four months. So I think if that's playing out this time, that means it could be 20,000 to 40,000 sometime in the fourth quarter. To get there, it would need to surpass the $13,400 level that has proven to be an issue so far this year. Facebook's Libra project, meanwhile, has a role to play here in terms of bringing new users on board, but won't be as influential as many industry observers have been predicting. In a world without Libra, is crypto going to be successful? Absolutely. So I don't think it changes the long-term outlook for Bitcoin. Then we can move on to Trace Mayer. Trace, I'm a huge fan of Trace Mayer. Extremely experienced guy in, in economics and law and Bitcoin. And here are his comments. He says, familiar with the president's working group on financial markets? Uh, GATA, I'm not sure what that means. No more markets, only manipulations. US Treasury translation. Manipulate Bitcoin markets to protect global markets from implosions. Bitcoin needs multi-trillion dollar market cap to do that. And that's a very interesting point. Very interesting point from Trace. And he's got another one here. Uh, actually, no, that's the same one. I thought that was the second one. Moving on to Caitlin Long. Caitlin Long, very experienced in the crypto space as well. Now, this is a little bit related to Facebook's Libra thing. It still plays into the overall um, sentiment coming from the United States at the moment. She says... 
The Senate Banking Com staff reached out last week regarding Facebook's Libra pursuant to my Forbes crypto article. During a conference call, they indicated interest in receiving formal testimony from me. Big takeaway, politicians that weaponize the US banking system, uh, blocking access to disfavored industries or countries, are modern day Herbert Hoovers because these barriers block both unlawful and lawful commerce. And these barriers caused the invention of stable coins in the first place. Okay, I didn't actually call them modern day Herbert Hoovers, the testimony, but I digress. If Congress isn't happy about Facebook's Libra, it can immediately make stablecoins irrelevant by letting banks uh, bank the crypto industry. And I give very specific recommendations here. A. Remove reputation risk as factor in bank examinations. Would alleviate de-risking and operation choke point. B. Ensure usability of the dollar to keep reserve currency status. Stop threatening to block access, which causes users to search for insurance policy. And like it or not, digital currencies are real alternatives. And C, roll back the Bank Secrecy Act and related compliance obligations on banks. With such paltry 0.002% conviction rate for money laundering, why on earth is Congress imposing such massive compliance costs and blocking unlawful, uh, blocking lawful commerce? There's an easy way to block all money laundering, tax evasion, terrorist financing, and criminal use of money. Just block all commerce. Modern day Herbert Hoover's. But seriously, every barrier to unlawful commerce also blocks some lawful commerce. And there needs to be a balance. Yeah, very wise words from Caitlin there. As I see this, Steve Mnuchin's new comments and really hope he reads my testimony. He is misguided. Moreover, the Bank Secrecy Act compliance requirements unlikely to survive constitutional challenge under the 2018 Supreme uh, Court Carter Carpenter decision. It says here, there's nothing unconstitutional about Congress passing unconstitutional laws. But when such laws also impose gigantic compliance costs, achieve only a paltry 0.002% conviction rate and erect real barriers to economic growth, Congress should seriously reconsider the whole approach. Next, a reality check. Cryptocurrencies can't be uninvented. Despite attempts to kill them, they haven't died. Facebook's Libra setting up shop in Switzerland instead of the United States is a shot across the bow to the US. Bad regulation sends innovators offshore rather than kills it. Congress should, though, hold Libra to its promise to keep 100% reserves permanently. Next, a regulatory compliant framework for digital currencies is possible and Wyoming shows how it can be done. There appears to be a push in Washington to require Facebook to get a bank license. Seriously, requiring Facebook's Calibra to get a bank license, if true, might have killed the project in the US because no federal bank regulator has yet approved banks to get involved with crypto. But Wyoming's new SD, uh, SPDI bank charter can bridge the gap, satisfying demands by Congress for a regulatory compliant solution, including AML compliance, while giving Facebook what it needs because it fits stablecoins very well. I'm almost positive Facebook's Calibra would be as welcomed in Wyoming as it appears to be unwelcomed in DC. Next though, there are very serious policy concerns with the project, privacy and interest payments. On privacy, the left fears big business. The right fears big government, but freedom-loving people should fear when big biz and big government collude. I propose Congress prohibit admission of Calibra data as evidence in US criminal cases unless the government first obtained a, val a valid warrant before Facebook gave it the data, plus similar for non-US governments. That would remove a big surveillance state concern, just make the data inadmissible as evidence unless obtained under a warrant. Another big concern is interest payments. Libra Association members are keeping the float and not paying interest to Libra holders. In the United Kingdom, the Bank of England just opened its interest bearing deposit acts to tech, including Libra, in addition to banks. Will the Fed do the same in the US? This is a major policy question. Should Libra's association benefit from central bank largesse in this way, directly or indirectly, at the cost of diluting every holder of the dollar, sterling, etc.? Why do banks benefit in this way too, as that practice becomes better understood? By voters, calls of both, where's my bailout? On the one hand and end the Fed on the other, will inevitably become louder. The US must tread carefully though, as other countries would probably love to court Facebook if the US regulation is too heavy handed. The US should recognise this huge demand for more efficient payment systems relative to the status quo, plus there are huge economic benefits to freeing up tra trapped comfort deposits on company balance sheets by speeding up payment latency. The Fed should stop coddling the slumbering incumbent payment system. Congress is already playing catch up. A bad regulations caused invention of stablecoins in the first place and Facebook already went outside of the US for the Libra Association, which should embarrass the US rather than fight the first deal.
first real innovation in payment systems in early in nearly 50 years. US should embrace it. Wyoming's suite of innovative laws show that such an embrace can be done largely within existing regulatory regime in a manner that provides legal certainty, protects consumers, and promotes innovation. So there you have it, guys. A brilliant thread from Kate Long and some really interesting thought-provoking comments and also from Trace Mayer and Tom Lee as well. But the question goes over to you guys as people involved in this industry, as people as investors or users of Bitcoin or enthusiasts or developers or whatever you're doing, what are your thoughts on all this at the moment? Do you see this as an increased risk of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency survival, at least in the United States? Or do you think this is a positive thing and this will just be added as another um, as another Bitcoin death to uh, to the Bitcoin death list? Do you think you know this is just going to blow over and nothing's going to happen? I'm really interested in hearing your opinions on this matter. So guys, that's it for the video. I appreciate you watching and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers. If you enjoyed the video today, then please consider leaving a like. And if you haven't subscribed yet, then come on board and also click the notification icon so you're always kept up to date. Leave a comment and tell me your thoughts on today's content. Then check out this next interesting video picked just for you.